Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, Chapter 7, Family Planning. It's easy to see why some people have wanted to separate parental care from the other kind of kin selected altruism. Parental care looks like an integral part of the reproduction, whereas, for example, altruism toward a nephew is not. I think there really is an important distinction hidden here, but that people have mistaken what the distinction is. They have put reproduction and parental care on the other side, and other side of altruism on the other. But I wish to make a distinction between bring new individual into the world, on the other hand, and caring for existing individual on the other hand. I shall call these two activities respectively childbearing and child caring. An individual survival machine has to make two quite different sort of decision. Caring decision and bearing decision. I use the word decision to mean unconscious strategy move. The caring decision are of this form. This is child is degreeable. Real litinous to me is so and so and so. The chance of dying if I do not feel it are such and such. Should I feel it? Bearing decision, on the other hand, are like this. Should I take whatever steps are necessary in order to bring a new individual into the world? Should I reproduce? To some extent, caring and bearing are bound to compete with each other for an individual time and other resources. The individual may have to make a choice. Should I care for this child or should I bear a new one? Depending on the, uh, on the ecological detail of the species, species, bearing mix of caring and bearing strategy can be evolutionary stable. The one thing is it cannot be evolutionarily stable is a poor caring strategy. If all individuals devote themselves to caring for existing children to such an extent that they never brought any new ones into the world, the population would quickly become invaded by mutant individuals who specialized in bearing. Caring can only be evolutionarily stable as part of a mixed strategy. At least some bearing has to go on. The species with which we are most familiar, mammal and bird, tend to be great carer. A decision to bear a new child is usually followed by a decision to care for it. It's because bearing and caring is so open to together in practice is that people have modeled the two things. But from the point of view of the selfish gene, there is, as we have seen, no distinction in principle between caring for a baby brother and caring for a baby son. Both important infants are equally closely related to you if we have to choose between PD1 or the other, there is no genetic reason why you should choose your own son, but on the other hand, you cannot. By definition, bear a baby brother, you can only care for him once somebody else has brought him into the world. In the last chapter, we look at how individual survival machine ideally should decide whether to behave altruistically toward other individuals who he already exists. In this chapter, we look at how they should decide whether to bring new individuals into the world. It's over this matter that the controversy about group selection, which I mentioned in Chapter 1, has chiefly raised. This is because one Edward, who had been mainly responsible for promulgating the idea of group selection did so in the context of the theory of population regulation. He, he suggested that individual animals deliberately and authentically reduce their birth rates for the good of the group as a whole. 
This is a good attractive hypothesis because it fits so well with what individual humans ought to do. Mankind is having too many children. Population size depends upon four things, birth, death, immigration, and emigration. Taking the world population as a whole, immigration and emigration do not occur, and we not, you are left with a birth and death. So long as the average number of children for couple is larger than two surviving to reproduce, the number of babies born will tend to increase over the years at an ever accelerating rate. In which generation the population, instead of going up by a fixed amount, increased by something more like a fixed proportion of the size that it has already reached. Since it's this size itself getting bigger, the size of increment gets bigger. If this kind of growth was allowed to go on unchecked, the population would reach astronomical proportions surprisingly quickly. Incidentally, a thing that is sometimes not realized even by people who worry about population problem is that population growth depends on when people have children, as well as on how many they have. Since population tends to increase by a certain proportion per generation, it follows that if you space the generation out more, uh, the population will grow at a slower rate per year. Banners that lead start at 2 could weakly well be changed to start at 30. But in any case, accelerating population growth spells serious trouble. You have probably all seen examples of the startling calculations, calculations that can be used to bring this home. For instance, the present population of Latin America is around 300 million and already many of them are undernourished. But if the population continues to increase at the present rate, it would take less than 500 years to reach the point where the people packed in a standing position from the solid human carpet over the whole area of the continent. This is so even if we assume them to be very skinny on a unrealistic assumption. In 1,000 years from now, they would be standing on each other's shoulders more than a billion deep. By 200 years, the mountain of people traveling outward at the speed of light we would have reached the edge of the known universe. It will not have escaped you that this is a hypothetical equation. It will not reach happen like that for some variable practical reason. The name of some of these regions are famine, plague, and war, or if you are lucky, birth control. It's no use appealing to advance in agricultural science. Green revolution and the like increase in food production may temporarily alleviate the problem, but it's mathematically certain that they cannot be a long-term solution. Indeed, like the medical advance that have precipitated the crisis, they may well make the problem worse by speeding up the rate of the population expansion. It's a simple logic truth that sort of mass emigration in space is rocket taking up at the rate of several million per second. Uncontrolled birth rate are bound to lead to horribly increased death rate. It's hard to believe that this simple truth is not understood by those readers who forbid their followers to use effective contraceptive methods. They express uh, preference for natural method of population limitation. And the natural method is exactly what they are going to get. It's called starvation. But of course, the uneasy that such long-term calculation arose is based on concern for the future welfare of our species as a whole, human, or some of them, 
have the conscious foresight to see ahead to the disastrous consequence of overpopulation. It's the Beijing assumption of this book that survival machine in general are guided by selfish gene who most certainly cannot be expected to see into the future, nor to have the welfare of the whole species at heart. This is where Wayne Edwards' part company is orthodox evolutionary theories. He thinks there is a way in which genuine austerity post control can evolve.